Good morning. Welcome to the King's Congregation. And welcome to our visitors as well. Very glad to have you with us this morning. We do encourage visitors to fill out a contact card at the back table. So you can be added to our list to receive the weekly King's Chronicle emailing. The Chronicle includes many worship resources and details of upcoming events. Following worship today, as always, we need to clear the sanctuary for all saints to begin setting up for their worship service. But please come to the Ambrose Main Lobby and enjoy a snack and coffee and fellowship. And let's uh, please be sure that we are good tenants in that space uh, since we're going to be having snacks over there today. And you're welcome to go to the playground, but it might be a little soggy out there. So please join us in the main lobby afterward for fellowship. This week, uh, Verity Preschool Co-op is having an end-of-year field trip to Baby Farms in Caldwell. That'll be Wednesday, May 8th at 11 a.m. Uh, admission is $12.50 for adults and $2.50 for children. All families are welcome, even if you've not been part of the co-op previously. Uh, please bring a picnic lunch for afterward, 
and RSVP before May 5th to Anna Kanzati. And her, mea- or her email is in the Chronicle. Men's Book Club, 7.30 p.m. this Wednesday, May 8th, at the Everson's home in Nampa. The address is in the Chronicle. They'll be discussing the book, The Great Siege, Malta, 1565. And uh, Luke Everson will lead the discussion. Looking ahead, registration is now open for the King's Congregation Kids Summer Music Camp, the Church Pianists Boot Camp, and the Adults and Children's Prelude Choir. These activities are scheduled from May 29th through July 3rd, so please sign up for that. Uh, Additional details are in the Chronicle, and there's a link to the registration page, and you can contact uh, Dr. Casey Christopher or Megan Montero with any questions. And we have our next head of household meeting will be Monday, May 13th at Pienza. So please keep that on your calendar. That's Monday, May 13th. And the King's Congregation will host the Hink Strings for a concert at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May 14th at Pienza. And this event is for the whole family. And there was an email that went out that had a registration link, so please register for that. We'd like to fill up Pienza if we can, so please look for that email and sign up. And I think that's what I've got for announcements. This is the day that our Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship our God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Amen. Amen. Let us worship the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> Lift up your heart. God our Father, praise is awaiting you in Zion, and to you the vow will be performed. O oh God who hears prayer, to you all flesh will come. How blessed is the one you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. By awesome deeds and righteousness, you will answer us, O God, of our salvation. For you are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far-off seas. Who established the mountains by your strength, you still the noise of the seas and the tumult of the peoples. You crowned the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. Little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy and sing to you. And so do we, O God our Father. We worship you and give you thanks together with the Lord Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you above and with the Holy Spirit who lives and reigns in us. One God, only God, world without end. Amen. Amen. King's congregation, you have heard the call. God has initiated to renew covenant worship with us. And we, uh, we want to respond to him. So let's respond by taking up our treasuries and turning to number 354, singing his own words back to him. From Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Just a note of instruction. Uh, We will sing it once through, all together. Following that, we'll have the kids join the altos to sing the first part.
They will be joined in the second part by the tenors, the third part by the sopranos, and the fourth part by the basses. And uh, we'll just sing it as a round once through. When you get to the last phrase, just repeat that last phrase until we're all in unison again together at the end. Let's sing. Amen. Please be seated. Preparing for a time of confession, I would ask you to turn in our bulletin to page 3. As we continue in the word, singing from Psalm 130, Out of the depths I cry to you. Let's sing together.
Yani. Our gospel word this morning comes from Luke chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Jesus said to his disciples, No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear for to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Last week's sermon was on Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, and the first word of that passage is a command to hear. It was a command that was at the heart of Israelite worship. Families would recite that passage every morning and every evening, and it was integral to their formation as a people and as individuals. And as Nathan pointed out, Shema is the Hebrew word for that first word, hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. However, the word means much more than simply the act of hearing. It's not a command to just allow the sound waves to pass through our eardrums. The command to hear includes the command to understand what is being spoken. This means to listen closely, to give all of our attention, or to use a more biblical idiom, to incline our ear. But understanding is not the only thing expected. Obedience is obviously the goal of every command. In fact, this same word, Shema, is used in Genesis 22:18, but it's translated there, obeyed. The great Abrahamic promise that in his offspring all the nations would be blessed is given because he shema the voice of the Lord when he commanded him to offer up his only son. He heard, he obeyed. Paul says in Romans 6, 19, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. I don't know that when we think about how to use the members of our bodies as instruments for righteousness that we automatically think about our ears. We might think of our eyes, what we allow them to gaze upon, or what we do with our tongues, if we set fires with them or if we build others up with them, or what we do with our hands, if we use them for evil or for service. But what and how we hear might be the most significant factor that determines the course of our lives. In our passage, Jesus is explaining the purpose of parables, and he gives a command in passing that we should slow down and consider. Take care, then, how you hear. Jesus' parables have a twofold purpose, to confuse the enemies of God and to reveal secrets to the friends of God. Every word of his is life and demands our hearing, our searching, and our obeying. As Peter confesses in John chapter 6, Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. Of all the members of our body, the ear may be the one we consider least, but it is most important. Indeed, it is the very word of God that resurrects the dead, that brings light to darkness, and creates and recreates worlds. And so as we come to confess our sins, we ought to consider two things. First... How have we taken care of how we hear? Have we been listening to serpentine voices? Have we allowed our ears to be filled with gossip and slander? Have we allowed ourselves to be shaped by voices who know not God or his word? Have we listened diligently to fools while ignoring the wisdom that God has laid up for us in his word? It is good to reflect on what we allow to pass through our ears and into our hearts and if God's word has been neglected, it's an opportunity to repent. Second, if any of those things are true, if we have been more attentive to the voices of sin in the world than to God, now is the time to clear out our ears, to open them up, and to hear the word of the Lord. Because God comes to us again this morning with words of mercy and grace and forgiveness. 
His response to our deafness is to speak once again. As the psalmist says in Psalm 45, our king comes to us with grace poured upon his lips. And thus the bride is commanded in verse 10 to use her ears wisely. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. So come, let us come and bow. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us use our lips to confess our sins for our Lord stands ready to hear, to incline his ear to our prayer. And let us use our ears to hear the good news of our victory in Christ once again. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now go before the Father having his assurance that he loves to forgive us in Christ. If you're able to do so comfortably, please kneel. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us life through the Spirit and commanded us to walk in the Spirit, bearing his fruit in our lives, love and joy, peace and patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But Father, we have not always walked in the Spirit this week. Sometimes our conduct, speech, and thoughts have borne more resemblance to the works of the flesh. Self-centeredness, envy, malice, impatience, impurity. We each confess those sins to you now. Father, forgive us each and all. Give us the power of your spirit to overcome our attitudes, habits, and instinctive reactions that displease you. Transform us into the likeness of your son, Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon. <clears throat> David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But then he immediately says, but certainly God has heard me, and he has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Like David, you have confessed the iniquity of your heart to the Lord, and as he did for David, so he has done for you. God has not turned away your prayer, nor his love from you. And so be at peace and rejoice, for your sins are forgiven in Christ. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. If I could please have the following individuals and families come up along with the elders. Emily Littlejohn, Taylor Fletcher, Shane McCullough, the Brown family, the King family, the Hayes family, and the Lynch family. And if there's anybody else who would like to <laughs> come up. Me and the elders will go down there. <laughs> Justin and Zach, you each speak on behalf of your household as well as yourself. 
Paul, Dustin, and Zach. On behalf of your households, Emily, Taylor, Shane, individually, since you're, you're joining individually, do you acknowledge that you were sinners in need of salvation by Jesus Christ? And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving and resting upon him alone as he is offered in the gospel? Do you all swear in the name of God in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit to live in a way that becomes followers of Christ? Do you all swear in the name of God to support the ministry of this local church in its worship and work, submitting to its government and discipline, while pursuing its purity and peace, as more particularly set out in the King's Congregation Covenant? Shane, with the exception of those being baptized this morning, have you and your households been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in accordance with his word? Dustin, Zach, and Elijah, since you have children being baptized covenantally this morning, do you bring these children for baptism believing that God has given you these children, claims them as his own, and therefore commands that his mark of ownership be placed upon them. Do you bring these children for baptism, trusting God's covenant promises, not only to be God and Savior to you, but also to your children, and persuaded that God desires these children to be part of his family, the church? And do you promise in faith and in reliance upon the grace of God and the strength of the Holy Spirit to raise up these children in the faith and in the training and discipline of the Lord as set forth in God's word. Let's pray. 
Almighty God and Father, we rejoice to welcome these families into the family of families of the King's congregation. And we rejoice to mark these believers with your sign of baptism, reveling in your ongoing work to flood the world in faith and allegiance to your Son, our Savior and King, Jesus the Christ. Help us to fulfill our covenant promises made here today, to love and build one another up, weave our lives together, and grow your kingdom in strength and power. Because your kindness to us is on display yet again, we thank you and worship you here and now by the Spirit, because of Jesus. And amen. 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 We have a reason to sing. Let's stand together. Turning in the treasury to number 708, 708, and singing, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let's sing together.
Amen. Please be seated. From our Old Testament scripture reading this morning, we'll be reading from Psalm 90. Psalm 90. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought up to end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days are passed away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, are, even by reason of strength, 80. Yet the span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of our Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 7, verses 17 through 22. Acts chapter 7. Starting in verse 17. <clears throat> but as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dwelt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, fathers, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and in deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand together and turn in the treasury to number 23 as we remain in the word, singing the words from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, in all the earth. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
Amen. Please be seated. Would you please pray with me this morning? Our great God and Father, we come before you in the name of your blessed Son, through whom we may confidently approach your throne of grace and find help in our time of need. We are thankful that you are a God who listens to your people and who stands for them as a strong tower and a mighty shield. Father, we know that you are a God who brings low the proud and lifts up the humble. We must acknowledge that we live in a proud and haughty nation who trusts far more in her own power than rightly fearing you. Bring us low that we might be lifted up. Strike us that you might lovingly bind our wounds. Teach us not to be wise in our own eyes, but to kiss the Son in reverence and obedience. Lord, we pray for our elected leaders, from President Biden through our Congress, down to our state and local leaders, to cease from doing evil and do good. Encourage those believers who are fighting to lead our country back to obedience to your word. Reveal the schemes of the enemy and sinful man. May such things be blown away like the chaff from the wheat. Father, we pray for the American church that she would put aside her sin of desiring a worldly king, caring far more for what the world thinks of her than what you do. Bring a reformation and grow us up a generation of godly men who are willing to fearlessly preach the word of God. May our churches stand out in the eyes of the world, not because of how relatable, relevant, or in step they are to cultural norms, but because they have become conformed to the image of Christ. We also pray for our brothers and sisters who are facing persecution around the world. We ask that you would strengthen them and that the church would continue to trample Satan under its feet. We especially pray for Christians in Sub-Saharan Africa, Pakistan, Ukraine, and China who daily face dangers and death. Guard and protect them as they labor for the gospel. Father, we are so grateful and thankful for the leadership of the King's Congregation. We thank you for Pastor Allen and Jeff Francian for their faithful pre preaching of the word, for the elders and deacons who continually pour themselves out to love and serve our church. Bless them and keep them as they do their work. Cause us as a body to labor with them and to obey them in such a way that their service would be a joy and not a grief. Father, we continue to pray for the many needs in our local body. We pray for those in and connected to our congregation who are in need of physical healing, their bodies. Please heal them and comfort them in this time and provide for their every need. We thank you for the grow, growing number of our congregation through babies and announcements of new pregnancies. Please bless and provide for these families as they seek to raise godly children. May we teach them diligently and recognize that, the, that they are your children first. Lastly, we ask for the softening of hearts of those who are hard and unrepentant and who have walked away from your church. Grant them the sweet gift of repentance that they might be restored to fellowship with you and your people. Finally, Father, we pray that you would bless our church such that we might be a blessing to all those around us in Idaho. Help us to hold fast to Christ and to give us by your grace the faith of Abraham. As things grow dark around us in our culture, may we sing more passionately, feast more joyfully, work more diligently, and love more sacrificially to the glory of our Redeemer and Savior. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand together and turn in the treasury to number 818. 818. as we celebrate our King Jesus Christ. Crown him with many crowns. Let's sing together.
seated. Well, this morning we return to our study of the book of Genesis, and we're going to be focusing on chapter 45, but so that we have our context in mind, we will start reading at chapter 44, verse 33. These are the words of God. Judah said to Joseph, now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad, He's referring to Benjamin, as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to prepare to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Joseph said, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan, bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this, take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives and bring your father and come. Also do not be concerned about your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, 
and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still, because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Gracious Heavenly Father, open your word to us this day that we might see your power and your glory. Fill us with gratitude and joy. Make us strong and courageous and fruitful that the earth may be filled with the knowledge of you as the waters cover the sea. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, we've been away from Genesis for about three weeks, so let's take a minute to remember where we are in terms of the big picture. One of the main features we've seen in Genesis is God sovereignly raising up Christ types, men who were living pictures of Christ in various ways, whom God used to show forth the gospel and cultivate faith in Christ who lay some 2,000 years or more into the future. And one of the most vivid Christ types that God raised up was Joseph whose story spans 14 chapters in Genesis, over a quarter of the book. And so we've seen many parallels between Jesus and Joseph. As Jesus was miraculously born to Mary, who could not conceive because she was a virgin, so Joseph was miraculously born to Rachel, who could not conceive because she was barren. As Jesus was promised exaltation as Lord of all in the scriptures, so Joseph was promised exaltation as Lord in the dreams that God gave him in Genesis 37. As Jesus was envied and hated and betrayed by his brethren into the hands of the Gentiles who afflicted and killed him, so Joseph was envied, hated, and betrayed by his brothers into the hand of Gentile Egyptians who afflicted him and threw him down into a dungeon, which was a picture of death. As Jesus, amidst all of his sufferings, entrusted himself to his Father and was heard, delivered from death with the resurrection and exalted over all, so Joseph, amidst all his sufferings, entrusted himself to God and was heard, delivered from the dungeon and exalted over all Egypt. As Jesus offered the bread of life and people of all nations came to him, so Joseph being exalted offered the bread of life from the famine and people from all the nations round about came to him. As Jesus saw Gentiles turning to him in repentance and faith much more readily than his fellow Israelites, So Joseph saw Egyptian Gentiles turning to him in repentance toward God much more readily than his own brothers. As Jesus devoted much time and effort to bring his fellow Israelites to faith and repentance, so Joseph devoted much time and effort to bring his brothers to faith and repentance. As Jesus, through the apostles, gave Israel opportunity to repent and turn to God, or else to compound their sin by rejecting the apostles as they had rejected Jesus. So Joseph, through his younger brother Benjamin, gave his older brothers opportunity to repent and turn to God, or else to compound their sin by rejecting Benjamin as they had rejected Joseph. In chapter 43, for example, Joseph throws a lavish feast to test his brothers. He gives each way more sumptuous food than they could possibly eat, but he gives Benjamin five times as much. That's the way envy works in the fallen world. It doesn't matter how many blessings we're overflowing with, how many good things we did not earn that we have. All that matters is someone else has more. So Joseph is testing his brothers to see if they will envy and hate Benjamin the way they envied and hated him. And in chapter 44, Joseph has his steward, 
plant Joseph's silver divining cup in Benjamin's sack. And then he has the steward frame Benjamin as a thief when he is caught red-handed with the cup in front of his brothers. Joseph is testing his brothers to see if they will abandon Benjamin and give him over the same way they did to Joseph years before. Remember, the brothers especially hated Joseph for his dreams of exaltation, dreams that supposedly showed the future. Now Benjamin is caught with Joseph's divining cup, which was a pagan method of supposedly telling the future. Now Joseph wasn't using the cup for that pagan purpose, but his brothers don't know that. They assume he's like all the other pagan rulers. Benjamin being caught with the cup makes it look like he stole it so he can tell the future, which makes Benjamin look like Joseph 2.0. Joseph all over again, seeking to exalt himself over his brothers. Are the brothers going to hate and abandon Benjamin as they did Joseph? We see Joseph testing his brothers until he sees what he's looking for. And he's not looking for a guilty conscience. The brothers have had that for years, but they've never dealt with their guilt. They've never returned to God. What Joseph is looking for is a changed heart, a heart of faith and repentance toward God, which manifests itself outwardly in a changed way of looking at others and acting toward others. And that is what Joseph finally sees in Judah, who was the natural leader of the brothers, but the last person we would ever expect to see a changed heart in, given how self-absorbed and self-willed he has been. But God can change anyone, and he changes Judah, which is what Joseph sees when Judah offers himself on behalf of Benjamin and his father Jacob. Remember, Benjamin is condemned to lifelong slavery for supposedly stealing Joseph's divining cup, and which will result almost certainly in the death of elderly Jacob because he's going to lose then his second and only remaining son from his deceased wife, Rachel, who died giving birth to Benjamin. So Judah approaches Joseph privately. He doesn't want his brothers to hear what he's going to say because he doesn't want any objections from them because he's going to offer himself instead. He explains to Joseph that if Benjamin doesn't return to Jacob, their elderly father is going to die. So he asks Joseph to take Judah as his lifelong slave so Benjamin can return to Jacob and Jacob can live on. For the first time in Judah's life, as far as we can tell, someone else's well-being is more important than his own. My life for theirs is the essence of his plea, and that is the essence of Christ's plea for us. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends, Jesus said, John 15. And he said that the very night that he was going to be arrested and then crucified. 1 John 3.16, the Apostle John says, By this we know love. This is what shows us love. Because Jesus laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Indeed, Jesus commanded in John 13.34, As I have loved you, you also love one another. And that is exactly what Joseph sees in Judah. This has been what he's looking for. So now, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Chapter 45, verse 3. But Joseph's brothers are dismayed. Literally, they are terrified. They're terrified that Joseph is going to give them what they deserve. Because he has all the power of Egypt. He could, he could chop their heads off. He could, he could hang them. He could throw them in the dungeon for the rest of their lives. He could do anything. It will be carried out immediately, and they deserve it. But Joseph calls his brothers near to him, verse 4, because his goal is not to condemn, but to save. John 3, 17, God did not give his son 
and send him into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what Joseph, as a living picture of Christ, is conveying to his brothers. Now, Joseph does not paper over their sin. He doesn't wave it away. In verse 4, he says, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So he doesn't just wave away their sin, but he does show them that there is a greater reality. No matter how great their sin is, there is a greater reality, and that is God's salvation. He tells them, verse 5, Do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. In other words, you intended evil, you did evil, but God is greater than your intent, and God is greater than the evil you do. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to, to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is looking to Joseph as his spiritual father. And he is Lord of all Pharaoh's house and ruler throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph will later tell his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to save many people alive. Genesis 50, verse 20. This is the same message that we will see the Apostle Peter preaching to the Israelites of his day in the very first Christian sermon on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. He tells them, Jesus being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken... By lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up. And then he concludes in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They deserve justice. They deserve to be punished. But Peter says to them, Repent. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. For the promise is to you. You see, Israel was a representative nation. They represented all of us. And that means that when they stood there and said, we have no king but Caesar, crucify him, give us Barabbas, crucify him, we were all there. We were all there we would have been saying the same thing because they represent the whole fallen humanity. And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he says, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call so Joseph tells his brother, hurry and get Jacob because five years of famine remain, verses 9 through 13. And he tells them that he will situate them near him in the land of Goshen so that he can watch over them and take care of them, verses 10 and 11. He tells them, relate all these things I've told you to Jacob and to assure them that they and Benjamin have spoken to Joseph face to face. They've heard all these words from his lips. And further, they've seen proof of Joseph's royal power and position in Egypt, verses 12 and 13. So Joseph kisses all his brothers, and it says, and they talked with him, verse 15. In other words, fellowship for the first time in over 20 years has been restored between Joseph and his brothers. It's been restored because sin and guilt are out of the way. You see, only by being reconciled to God through Joseph, the Christ type, could this be accomplished. And that's a picture of the fact that only by being reconciled to God through Christ are we capable of having true union and fellowship with one another in any context. Church, marriage, family, work, society. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as God is in the light, 
then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Christ is the only way that sinners can have true union and fellowship. So Joseph exhorts his brothers, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Verse 24. Now the word troubled means to contend and dispute with one another. He's saying do not contend and dispute with one another along the way. You see the brothers are going to have to fess up now and be honest with their father. The truth is going to have to come out about what happened to Joseph. And it would be human nature for fallen sinners to start pointing fingers at one another on the way back. It was more your fault than mine, that sort of thing. Joseph says, don't even start down that road. They are forgiven and they are restored, not because they're a little less guilty than someone else, but because God has acted to forgive them and he has restored them in his sovereign grace and love. If they understand that, then they will be overflowing with gratitude to God and they will be happy to forgive the much smaller debts that they owe to one another. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, all ill intent. And be, this is what you be instead. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what Jesus is getting at in the Sermon on the Mount when he teaches us to pray, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then Jesus explains that if we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us, Matthew 6, 12 through 15. Now Jesus is not saying that we somehow earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. He's saying that the whole point of salvation is to re restore, restore us unto God as his sons and daughters so that we can be like the Father who created us in his image and saved us through his Son. God forgives us through Christ, but being forgiven doesn't make us like God. Forgiving makes us like God because he paid a great Christ so that he might forgive. If he's our father, then we will naturally want to be like our father because that's what true children do. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God as dear children. If we refuse to forgive others, then we are behaviorally saying that we do not want to be like the Father, which is another way of saying to the Father, you are not my Father. It's a disavowal of the relationship, which is the whole point of salvation. So it's a disavowal of salvation. That's what Jesus is teaching us. Joseph's brothers are new men now, and they need to act like it. That's why Joseph gives them changes of garments, verse 22. Ephesians 4.22 says the same thing. Put off the old man. Take off the old garment. Put off the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Put on the new man. Put on a new garment which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now if you remember back in chapter 35, God tells Jacob to, to go to Bethel and worship him there. And Jacob has to tell his sons, to get rid of all their idols, resulting in a big pile of them that they leave behind. And then he tells them, change your garments. Chapter 35, verses 1 through 4. In other words, put off your old idolatrous self. Stop committing spiritual adultery against the one true God. Put on the new man and walk in faith and faithfulness. Well, the brothers, back in chapter 35, changed their garments, but they did not put on the new man. 
They were still the same old hardened sinners who envied and hated Joseph, sold him into slavery, and then covered it up from their father. Joseph is telling them in our text, do it for real this time. Put on the same new man that Judah has. So Joseph sends his brothers off in royal fashion with 10 donkeys loaded with Egyptian gifts, another 10 donkeys loaded with grain and bread and food, 300 pieces of silver for Benjamin, carts for Jacob and all the women and children so they don't have to walk on the return journey, verses 21 to 23. And Pharaoh is heart and soul behind this, verses 16 to 20. He learns of Joseph's brothers, no doubt through the servants of Joseph who overheard Joseph revealing himself to his brothers back in verse 2. Now normally, them hearing Joseph, their master, weeping is the sort of thing that would typically cause servants to hold their master in contempt and to begin to circulate malicious gossip about him. But that's not the result here which means Joseph's servants love him. They respect him. They embrace him. And so does Pharaoh and all his servants. That almost certainly means they have come to faith even as Pharaoh has. As Joseph says, God has made him a father to Pharaoh. He is Pharaoh's spiritual father. So the servants of Joseph's house bring the news to the servants of Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh hears of it and is glad And so are his servants. They're excited that all of Joseph's family is coming to Egypt, verse 16. So he's completely behind sending all the carts and the gifts and the food, and he personally promises the best of the land to Joseph's family, verses 17 to 20. So Joseph's brothers return to Jacob and tell him, Joseph is still alive and is governor of all Egypt. And predictably, Jacob does not believe them, verse 26. You see, for many years now, Jacob has not been able to trust his sons, the older sons, Joseph's older brothers. Remember all the things that have happened. Reuben slept with Jacob's wife, Billah, chapter 35, verse 22. That's Jacob's firstborn. Simeon and Levi deceived Jacob and the whole town of Salem into believing that if the men of the town will be circumcised and come into the covenant, then Shechem, the prince of the city, could marry Jacob's daughter Dinah, their sister. But when the men were recovering from circumcision, God's sacrament, Simeon and Levi slaughter all of them. And then the other brothers join in plundering the city so that every single wife in Salem is rendered a widow and every single child fatherless, all from using God's covenant sign as a ruse. Chapter 34. And I've already mentioned the big pile of idols that Jacob made his older sons dump on the way to Bethel. And moreover, it's been over 22 years now since Joseph disappeared. Jacob has suffered greatly in missing him. And the report that he's been alive all this time and is now governor of all Egypt seems, frankly, too good to be true. It's not until Jacob carefully considers the detail of Joseph's reported words, as well as the royal carts sent to carry him and the women and children, that Jacob believes their words in verse 27. Then Jacob's spirit revives in verse 27. In other words, Israel is back. Notice the wording of verses 27 and 28. The spirit of Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Gone is the man frozen by fear. Back is the one who wrestled with God all night long. And with his hip out of joint, still wrestled, saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Chapter 32, verse 26. The one whom God blessed and changed his name to Israel, he is back. They will go to Egypt. For the first time in over 22 years, Israel has sons in the full sense of the word. 
because fellowship with God and one another has been restored. There are two songs that I think capture the way Israel and his sons must have felt at this point as they traveled back to Egypt. First is Psalm 133, starting at verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Verse 3, it's like the dew on Hermon, that's a mountain, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. True unity and fellowship here between one another is a foretaste of eternal life. It's a foretaste of the full, renewed, and glorified earth being joined with heaven where God's will is truly done on earth as it is in heaven. Even among Christians, even in church circles, it is rare, it is very rare for a congregation to, to really dwell in true unity, love toward one another, real peace, that is a blessing that God has to, to give out just like he would send dew down on a mountain. I have experienced that because I've been a Christian, well, 40 years. I've experienced that once in 40 years. Now, many blessings in many different Christian congregations that we belong to, many wonderful Christians we've been around, many wonderful elders, pastors, and so forth. But... Only once have we experienced what it's like when God pours out that blessing like they do on Mount Hermon, and, and it's palpable. I mean, you could cut it. It's so thick. The unity, the love that's flowing, uh, and the people of the congregation, they just want to be together. They just want to be together and fellowship together, rejoice together, help one another, serve one another. It's, it's not something we can work out, up. I mean, we can't work it up. God has to pour it out. And it is something that we should pray for. It is truly one of the great blessings of God. The second psalm is Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Now, this is in the future from Jacob and Joseph. It's, it's when Israel's returning from the Babylonian captivity. But this has to be the way Jacob and his sons felt like at this point, like they've been in this captivity for over 20 years. He said, we were like those who dream. We can't believe it's real. It seems like the kind of thing you dream about but never happens. He says, our mouth was filled with laughter. Now, this is not like the laughter that Ecclesiastes talks about that's like thorns in the fire. It's laughter, it's cackling and crackling, but it's empty. It's nihilistic. No, this is laughter that is because of sheer joy, just sheer joy resulting in laughter. And our tongues were filled with singing. And they said among the nations, all who witness, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. It's the way that Sarah felt after so many years of being barren, all of that suffering, even trying to come up with her own ways to get around her barrenness, which just backfired, made everything worse. And then finally, when not only is she barren, now she's too old. She's past menopause. She cannot possibly have a child now. God gives her a son because, again, that was another Christ type, another miraculously born son to a woman who could not have children. And when she finally, when, when God earlier was reiterating the promise, she laughed. But it was this empty laugh, a wry laugh, a, a laugh of incredulity. God says, no, Sarah is going to have a son. And she goes, you know, laughs, just like, yeah, right. Now she laughs when she has a son, but this is the laugh of joy. And so it's like people who laugh out of joy are joining in Sarah's laughter. And that's what Psalm 126 is talking about. And this is a laughter that 
is there for all of us to participate in as well. That must have been the way that Joseph and his sons felt. So let us pray for the same blessings upon us and all of God's people. I commend all of these things. Think about, this is some 4,000 years ago that God's doing all this. And when you look at it, you see the care that God had for his people. Look how he's constantly preaching the gospel to them. A lot of times we think they didn't have the gospel. They had the gospel. He was always giving them the gospel. He was always pointing forward to Christ. He was caring for them, doing all these works. Just think about the power and the glory of God in the midst of their lives and all the things that were going on at that time. This is the same God who now has exalted his son Jesus to his right hand. Christ, who Joseph pictured, is the one who now presides over the nations working his purposes. If he's able to do all of these things that we see in our text, he's able to do much more in our own day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let us stand now and confess the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Christian, whom do you believe in? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into Hades. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now present our thank offerings to the Lord as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for all of your blessings that you've given us in Christ. You have held nothing back. You have given us your whole self and all that is yours. And you signify all of that through this table where you seat us. And you give us this bread and this wine. And you say to us every single week, you are my children. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good.
We give you thanks for the bread of life, the body of Christ that was broken for us. And we thank you in his name. Amen. It was on the very night our Lord was betrayed that he took bread and broke it. He said, this is my body which is given for you. Take eat as often as you do as a memorial to me. The bread of life, let's eat it together with joy. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Our God and Father, we thank you for the blood of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus that takes our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Lord God, we give you thanks in his name. Amen. Our Lord took the cup with the wine. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. It's my blood. And it's offered for the remission of sin. Drink it as often as you do as a memorial to me, for in this way you will show forth my death until I come. The blood of the new covenant, let's drink it together with gladness. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you, and your right hand upholds me. Amen. Please stand for the blessing of the Lord. <clears throat> okay. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. We will teach them diligently to our children and shall talk to them when we sit in our homes, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, and when we rise up. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great love of God the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.